While you probably don't want to watch or listen to this episode with your kids, unfortunately, the transgender activists are at it again. This time, there is a teacher outside of Toronto who is wearing something really inappropriate, I guess, to try to make a point about his so-called gender identity. We're going to talk about that, and we're also going to discuss some good news coming out of the state of Virginia, not just when it comes to gender ideology, but also when it comes to parents' rights. Then we will talk to my friend Jennifer Law about her new documentary, The Detransition Diaries. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com slash Allie. That's GoodRanchers.com slash Allie. All right, before we get into all of the crazy gender madness, I want to talk about two things. First and foremost, you see my sticker, my new sticker on the back of my laptop. It says question everything. And it has a T-Rex with an American flag landing on the moon. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, or if you have no idea why we created this sticker, then you need to go back and listen to episode 670. 670. You need to go listen to episode 670 because we talked about this and it made some people very, very mad. And so we decided to make a sticker out of it. So you can get it. We'll link it in the description of this episode and um, you can buy it for yourself. It's just five bucks and it's really fun. And finally, I have this empty space on my laptop filled. It's been really bothering me for a long time. And we got a couple other items coming down the pipeline too. Um, Also, I saw this clip this morning. It's from the CNN Don Lemon show, which has actually been canceled. He's moving to the morning now, I think with a couple co-hosts, but he interviewed this woman named Hillary Fordwich. She is a royal commentator, a business development leader. I don't really know what that means, but Don Lemon thought that he was raising I guess a compelling question about slavery and colonialism reparations being paid by the royal family to the descendants of those who suffered from these things. And her response is just incredible. Here it is. And then you have those who are asking uh, for reparations for colonialism. And they're wondering, you know, $100 billion, $24 billion dollars here and there, 500 million there. Some people want to be paid back and, uh, and members of the public are wondering, why are we suffering when you are, you know, you have all of this vast wealth? Those are legitimate concerns. Well, I think you're right about reparations in terms of if people want it though, what they need to do is you always need to go back to the beginning of a supply chain. Where was the beginning of the supply chain? That was in Africa and when that crossed the entire world when the slavery was taking place, which was the first nation in the world that abolished sla- uh, slavery? The first nation in the world to abolish it. It was started by William Wilberforce, was the British. In, in Great Britain, they abolished slavery. 2,000 naval men died on the high seas trying to stop slavery. Why? Because the African kings were rounding up their own people. They had them on cages waiting in the beaches. No one was running into Africa to get them. And I think you're totally right. If reparations need to be paid, we need to go right back to the beginning of that supply chain and say, who was rounding up their own people and having them handcuffed in cages? Absolutely. That's where they should start. And maybe, I don't know, the descendants of those families where they died at the, in the high seas trying to stop the slavery, that those families should receive something too, I think, at the same time. It's an interesting <laughs> discussion, Hillary. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We'll continue to, to discuss in the future. Uh, I don't think that Don Lemon was expecting that kind of answer. I mean, she was just so confident. And I don't think that his brain saw exactly where she was going. But I thought that that was a brilliant answer. And I'm so glad that she brought up William Wilberforce, who is an amazing ambassador for the gospel, an incredible and bold Christian. He said, this. He said, God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners. And that's what he set out to do throughout his life. There were 
Other countries who abolished slavery around the time that Britain did, but really William Wilberforce was on the front lines of this. He was at the helm. He was the one that was pushing the abolition of slavery and his motivation for it wasn't primarily political. It was spiritual. It was a gospel motivation because he believed he knew that all people are made in the image of God. He rejected the ideology that secular progressivists hold today, which is that we are just clumps of cells. We're just accidental balls of matter. We're basically just bodies. We are self-creating, self-declaring, self-identifying. No, he believed, he knew that we were made by God and made in his image and given innate worth and therefore the objectification that is inherent in chattel slavery is wrong. And so he set out to persuade his fellow countrymen to abolish slavery and it was an uphill battle. He was in the minority for most of history. This is something that Thomas Sowell writes about. For most of history, Slavery was not a moral question. It just was. It was just something that was a part of life. Now, slavery looked different, different times in different cultures. Very often, slavery in the ancient world was a way to uh, get out of debt. You were kind of considered a bond servant. Um, And then, of course, that is different from the kind of slavery that was practiced in places like Britain or the United States, which was really just chattel slavery. It wasn't to uh, it wasn't to pay off any debt. And yet slavery really wasn't a spiritual question. It really wasn't a moral question that a whole lot of people were asking for most of history. And Christianity changed that. The morality of Christianity slowly and over time revolutionized, at least in the Western world, what people thought about human beings, what people thought about the vulnerable, and what people thought about right and wrong. When Christianity came on the scene in pagan Greece and Rome, There was no thought to the inherent worth of human beings, the protected class of women and children. It was only the adult free male who was seen as having any value because he was the only one who could really produce anything for society. Slaves, the elderly, women, children were all subjugated in these ancient societies. And Christianity came along. And through its theology, that all people are made in the image of God, through its gospel that says we are all equally dead in sin apart from Christ and equally alive in Christ by grace through faith in him, revolutionized how people thought about the world, how people thought about themselves, and how people thought about their fellow human beings. And governments conformed to that Christian idea of not just inherent worth, but inherent human rights. The idea of human rights, because we are human, because we are different than animals, because we are distinct from plants, because we are inherently valuable, is based on Christian theology. Like you'll notice why most of the charities, most of the hospitals, even most of the universities, and most institutions that have fought for true human rights are were founded by Christians, had at one point a Christian mission. And it's obvious what happens when you get away from that worldview. It, it's obvious what happens when you get away from that founding mission. The idea of humanity, what we are, what we are worth deteriorates. It's also worth noting that there are many, many countries in the world today that do not have that view of human beings who still practice slavery and who still subjugate human beings, either based on their gender, based on their class. Like in Africa today, there is still a slave trade. And so those who say that only America or only Britain has to pay reparations, it's not logical because as this guest pointed out, it doesn't go all the way to the supply chain, and it ignores the reality that slavery is still practiced in many ways and in many countries legally to this day. But that's what the brain does on CRT. CRT in its crudest form is 
black oppressed, white oppressor. And if that is the lens through which you see the world, then it is impossible to say that Africans could be on the hook for part of the slave trade. Or that there are people who are not white who were at the very least complicit in the oppression of other black human beings. And yet the history of the world is messy. It is not broken down in that black-white dichotomy. The history of the world is a history of being enslaved and being enslavers, of being oppressed, of being oppressors, of being colonizers, of being colonized, of being the conquered, and of the one doing the conquering. That is the history of the world. That is the history of every people group, of every skin color, of every ethnicity, of every nationality. As she pointed out, if we want to start calculating who's getting reparations, everyone is going to be owed something. But guess what? Guess what? The gospel frees us from that complicated, illogical mess of trying to figure out who owes us what based on the sins of people who may have looked like us at some point in history in the same geographical region that we currently live in. It's illogical. It's based on a collectivist mentality that really has no grounding in reality and certainly has no grounding in Christian theology. So that was longer. That was a, more of a response than I anticipated giving. But this Hillary Ford, which lady gave such a good point, I hope that gives something uh, to Don Lamond chew on for a little bit. All right. Speaking of being made in the image of God and being detached from that reality, from that truth, leading to us seeing the world and seeing ourselves and seeing our fellow human beings in a way that is wrong, that is unhealthy, let us talk about the gender madness that continues to play out in absolutely ludicrous and very harmful ways in our society. Before we get to the first story on that, let me tell you about our first sponsor for the day. This is an awesome company. It's Public Square. I met these guys just the other day in passing. We were at the same event and they are just the real deal. And it's an awesome service. We talk about all the time. How do we decide which businesses uh, businesses to support? We want to make sure that our dollars are going towards companies that are supporting the values that we believe in. Like we don't want to be using our dollars to pay for someone's abortion because the company donates to Planned Parenthood. And Public Square, it's spelled one word, Public SQ, is an app that allows you to search for businesses and services in your area that align with your values. Also, you can list your business for free on Public Square on the app. It's super simple. You can find the kinds of businesses in your community that you want to support. Just download the Public Square app from the Apple App Store, Google Play, create an account, begin your search. You can also list your business for free so your local community can support you. Download the app today. That's Public Square, spelled Public SQ, Public SQ. All right, I want to talk about this crazy story that I saw circulating on Twitter over the weekend. It's a teacher in the Toronto area who is wearing, and this is, let me just say, like this is probably not good to listen to or to watch with your kids around because unfortunately, this is a very creepy and perverse and just a strange story that you probably just don't want them hearing about or seeing. But it is a teacher, a man, all right, a man wearing these massive fake boobs, all right? And we're not just talking about any massive fake boobs. Like we are talking about massive fake boobs that, um, how do I say this politely? did not have a bra on. And so we're going to play, there's no sound in this clip, but we're going to play a little clip. And just so you can see that I'm not making this up. It's a very brief clip just for the purpose of evidence. Here it is. Yep. Okay. So you see that. And I don't know, he's teaching shop class. Uh, He's got like a saw. He's trying to Cut a piece of wood. All right. He's wearing a skirt. He's got a terrible wig on. Not convincing at all. And he is somehow, I mean, he looks absolutely ridiculous. This is why it is so hard to tell the difference between satire 
and reality. And this is what I said on Twitter, and I absolutely believe that this is true, that this is a form of sexual harassment. He is around a bunch of young teenage boys wearing these prosthetic breasts, not because he actually thinks that he is a woman, but because he has a fetish, because he is getting off on this because he likes the idea of these little boys gawking at his breasts. That's how perverse this is. And if you have listened to my interview with Genevieve Gluck, if you have not, I highly recommend doing so. And I'm about to have her back on the program. She has, through her research and through her journalism, uncovered the roots of this ideology and the kind of men in power who are pushing this kind of thing. And it comes from a place not of empathy, not of affirmation, not of compassion and understanding, but a place for men from sexual perversion. I'm not saying that all men who truly struggle with gender dysphoria have what is called autogynophilia. And that is where you get turned on by Um, in their case, dressing up like a woman. I'm not saying that for everyone who struggles with gender confusion as a man, that it is coming from a place of sexual perversion. But the ideology, the activists, the bulk of this movement, what is pushing this forward, it absolutely does come from a place of fetishism. It comes from different forms of now popularized pornography where men are sissified for the purpose of sexual pleasure. There is also an inextricable relationship with pedophilia going on here. It's not a coincidence that you keep hearing these stories of men who like to dress up as sexualized women and dance in front of children or walk around in front of young men. There's nothing innocent about that. Like there's no innocuous reason for a man to want to dress up in drag clothes, in fake boobs, in titty tassels, and in thongs and get dollar bills from young children. Like there, there's, no, there's no good justification for that. And the same, the same goes for this instance. And in case you think that this is just some big joke that conservatives are blowing out of proportion that we shouldn't really care about, the high school, which is Oakville Trafalgar High School outside Toronto, has come out now saying, oh, well, you know, this is, uh, this is just something that happens. We accept gender identity. We want to be accepting. Uh, Redux Magazine says this, that the teacher is trans- transgender, so-called, and pre-transitioning was known to students and faculty as male. And went by a male name. The man allegedly began identifying as woman last year. Imagine that you live your life for however long, 40 years, and all of a sudden you want to become a woman and not just like an actual woman, but someone with like boobs the size of Saturn. Uh, The kids here most definitely don't think it's normal, but realistically, we can't say anything. One student said on Twitter last year, the teacher was a man. I don't think the school can fire him. Think about the discomfort and the confusion that you are purposely putting on children here, not to mention the sexualization that is so obviously intended in him wearing something like this. In October 2021, this high school released guidelines, uh, the Halton District School Board released guidelines Um, regarding so-called gender identity and gender expressions, says school staff have to use preferred pronouns. They have to uh, allow students to use the change room that is most gender affirming. So you see how something that is a common thread in this movement is that everyone else's safety and comfort always has to be sacrificed for the delusions of the people who say that they're the opposite gender. Even ridiculous ones like this. Like this person's not trying to be subtle. This person's not just saying, oh, you know, like this just makes me more comfortable if I can wear some nail polish or some lipstick. No, he is trying to be as overt about this as possible. This person just wants attention because he has a sexual predation fetish going on here. And if we are not willing to call this what it is for the sake of children, for their minds and their eyes and their hearts, then like, what is your line? Like if you were someone, especially if you call yourself a Christian and you see this and you're like, oh, well, it's none of my business. I should just affirm this. Let's just have empathy for this person. What is your line? 
Like, what's your boundary? At what point do you say, okay, yeah, I'm going to probably start speaking up about this? Or, yeah, I think that this is a problem. Like, what is it? Now that you have seen, if you're paying attention at all, grown men on a regular basis in different cities in this country uh, dancing almost naked in front of young children for money, now that you have seen that children's hospitals are regularly cutting off the healthy breasts of minors, the healthy penises of minors, leaving them with irreversible damage, all of this happening legally, now that you know all of that, are you willing to admit that maybe this is a problem, an unconditional affirmation and superficial, unhealthy, dangerous forms of empathy maybe are not the answer? Like, are you willing to, to wake up to this reality? Because look, Children are being placed on the altar of this. It's not just some conservative culture war that we're blowing out of proportion. I wish to God that that was the case. I wish that this weren't happening. But unfortunately, it is. Unfortunately, our children are a victim of it. And the high school said that this does not violate the dress codes. Um, and that we, they are simply trying to create a community that is committed to, they said, establishing and maintaining a safe, caring, inclusive, equitable, and welcoming learning and working environment for all students and staff. That was their response to this ridiculous man wearing these fake breasts. What they actually mean is that everyone has to sacrifice having a welcoming and healthy learning and working environment so this person isn't offended. That's what they're actually saying. That's how much we care about children in this world, in today's society. That's how much we care about their well-being. That we are prioritizing the fetishes of perverted grown men over the safety and security and well-being of adolescents. That's where we are. It's really disgusting and it's really disturbing and I wish parents in this area, I know Canada, I mean, there's a lot of you from Canada and I love you so much and you're so strong and you've stood so strong over the past couple of years, especially, but I think even you would agree in some cases, Canada just seems too far gone. But I wish, I hope that there are some parents in this area who will stand up and say no, because there is strength in numbers. Things can absolutely change. And you know, one piece of evidence that things can change for the better Glenn Youngkin, the governor of Virginia, he has made an amazing move when it comes to the transgender student policies in the state of Virginia, and his election was the result of a number of parents standing up and saying, enough, I'm tired of this going on in our public school system. I'm tired of pornography. I'm tired of critical race theory. I'm tired of this left-wing indoctrination, the driving the wedge a wedge between parents and children. I'm tired of it. We are going to vote for a party that is not in bed with the corrupt teachers union. And Glenn Youngkin, an underdog, won the gubernatorial race in Virginia. People said that that would never happen, and it did. And now he is enacting good policies that are going to protect parental rights and protect children. So praise God for that. And I am going to explain to you the details of those things in just one second. Let me tell you about our next sponsor, and that is Birch Gold. All right, guys, you need to make sure that your savings are protected. You know inflation is crazy and things are just turbulent. We don't know what the future holds. So you want to make sure that your money is as protected as possible. So own something that has never been valued at zero, and that is gold. It is your best hedge against inflation, which is rising like crazy, as you know, as we speak. The savviest Americans diversify their savings to protect them from downturns in the market, from global instability, and from a falling dollar. Birch Gold helps you hold gold and silver in a tax-sheltered retirement account. In fact, if you have a 401k or IRA that's underperforming, just text Allie to 989-898. You can convert that IRA into precious in, into an IRA and precious metals right now. Text Allie to 989-898. You'll get a free info kit. That's Allie to 989-898. All right, let me tell you about this awesome, uh, awesome change by 
Governor Yunkin of Virginia. So this is according to NBC and um, and Fox 5. NBC obviously not happy about this. Fox 5 a little more neutral in their reporting. So Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin on Friday updated model policies regarding the treatment of transgender students. The Virginia Department of Education updated its 2021 model policies for the treatment of these students, noting that the guidelines under the previous administration disregarded the rights of parents. So under the Democrat uh, administration and ignored other legal and constitutional principles that significantly impact how schools educate students, including transgender students. So that's a little troubling that that even existed. Not surprising based on how the school boards had been acting in Virginia. But that came from a Democrat controlled Department of Education, which is and has been for a long time seeking to undermine the rights of parents and to make sure that the primary mentor and caretaker for students is the public education system. Virginia's Department of Education under Yunkin has now listed first under the guiding principles section that, quote, parents have the right to make decisions with respect to their children and that the policies shall be drafted to safeguard parents' rights with respect to their child and to facilitate the exercise of those rights. The policies go on to cite the 14th Amendment in the Constitution, which gives parents a fundamental right to direct the upbringing and education of their children. The new model policy says students' participation certain school programming and use of school facilities like bathrooms or locker rooms should be based on their sex with modifications offered only to the extent required under federal law. The policies also say that students who are minors must be referred to by the name and pronouns in their official records unless a parent approves the use of something else. And so obviously I would like for kids to never be referred to as anything other than what their sex is. But in this case, they are saying, look, the parent has to know. And if you don't know, this is a huge problem across the board of not just individual teachers, but even school systems saying that they are going to allow a child to go by a different name, to go by a different gender, to go by different pronouns. And the school or the teacher will ask the students, is it okay for me to call you by this name and pronouns in front of your parents? If the child says, no, please don't, then these schools will keep it a secret from their parents. And you see the idea that is um, within that kind of practice, and that is that parents are a threat, that parents are a real danger to their kids, and that these teachers and that this school, uh, that they know better, that they love the kids better, that they um, are better at seeking the interest of this child, which is always just unconditional affirmation of who the child declares that they are. So the parent who has known that child from birth who was there when they either adopted that child or when the doctor laid that child on their chest, who knows everything about that child from their favorite food, from their favorite memory, who has woken up countless times in the middle of the night to comfort that scared child, who knows their child's strengths and weaknesses, hopes and dreams, who loves that child more than life itself, would die a thousand deaths for that child. Under previous policies, the Virginia Department of Education said, no, that parent doesn't have authority. The public school system does. The state does. And that is true in many, many states across the country. And that is wrong. That is morally wrong. Obviously, as Christians, we know that's theologically wrong. And yes, of course, there are cases in which the state and public schools need to step in when there is legitimate abuse when there is legitimate fear of abuse and mistreatment by the parents. But these schools are already, these teachers are already mandatory reporters. In most states, by law, they are required to say if they believe that that child is actually being abused or neglected or mistreated at home. That is something that they are legally bound to do. So in all of these cases, when you hear that the teachers are keeping secret the pronouns of these kids from their parents. It's not actually because they think these parents are abusive. They would have already reported them. It's because they want to drive a wedge between parent and child. Of course, that's demonic. That is satanic. That's what the dark powers that be have been trying to do since the beginning of time. If you look at the history of communism, for example, in the 20th century, 
or even fascism, any kind of totalitarianism. One of the first orders of business that the state does is try to recruit child soldiers and take them away from the care and from the mentorship of their parents. I mean, George Orwell even writes about this in 1984, how Big Brother would turn children from their parents and the, and the, and the children would become spies against their parents and turn them in to the secret police if their parents committed any thought crime or any infraction. And so... This is out of the left-wing playbook. This is out of the totalitarian playbook and always has and always has been. Um, We have talked about the consequences of this, how children who are separated from their parents and then are pushed into transition by school counselors, by school administrators, they often become, if not just completely depressed, uh, suicidal. They're taken out of their home. They're put in different kind of shelters. They often end up homeless. They're not better off without their parents, without the people who care for them. It's actually the exact opposite of what these trans activists say, that, oh, if parents don't affirm their child and allow them to go on hormones and puberty blockers and get double mastectomies, then these kids are going to commit suicide. No, it's actually part of it is actually the breakdown of relationships and the lack of true love that often happens when this ideology breaks parents apart and separates children from their parents that causes them so much mental distress in isolation. So I'm so glad that Governor Yunkin and his Department of Education is doing this. This really will save lives. It'll save families. It'll save Um, a lot of anxiety in parents, but it really will save the lives of young people as well. Uh, Schools may not encourage teachers to conceal information about a student's gender from his or her her parents. Parents must be given an opportunity to object before counseling services pertaining to gender are offered. Praise God. Uh, The 2022 policies are designed to provide clear, accurate, and useful guidance to Virginia school boards that align with statutory provisions and took into account 9,000 public comments, according to the Virginia Department of Education. Oh, isn't this, uh, what's it called? Democracy? Hmm, I thought that leftists said that they like that. Every local school board is required to adopt policies that are consistent with these new 2022 model policies. The guidance is subject to 30-day public comment period that opens later this month. You know, praise God. It really matters who you vote for. I mean, this is a result of two things that we say so much. It's a result of parents raising a respectful ruckus for the things that matter trying to get him elected that is translating into real policy change that is really going to positively impact people. And it's also people recognizing that politics matter because policy matters because people matter. Politics affects policy. Policy affects people. And while the Republican Party is so far from perfect, and I just wish there were more more Republicans who would actually just do something, who would stand up and push back and not be so cowardly and not give in on every social and cultural issue because they think it's too divisive and they're afraid of the LGBTQ lobbyists that are going to go against them. While I wish that the GOP was more conservative and more courageous and more clear, there are some good ones out there. And I really have a hard time understanding why anyone at this point, knowing the ideology of each platform, would vote Democrat. Now, I understand if you completely agree with the ideology, if you're like, yeah, parents should be secondary in authority to the state and to teachers. Yeah, we should be transing our kids. Like, if that's your idea, then yeah, I guess I understand. If you're like, yeah, you know, I think that mass homelessness and increased crime in murder, like what's happening in Illinois with their new bill or new law, which is actually going to turn the state into basically the purge, what's happening in California, what's happening in Austin, what's happening in Denver, what's happening in Oregon and Washington with homelessness and crime just absolutely rampant. I guess if you think that that's good, if you think that record inflation is good, um, if you think calling all of your political opponents fascist and threat to the re- a threat to the republic is good, if you think unfettered abortion paid for by the taxpayer is good, like if you think all of those things are good, I understand why you would vote Democrat, more power to you. But if you don't, I can't say that I comprehend your vote. I, I can't say that I comprehend at this point with as much as we know now how you could vote Democrat. Are you still really under the impression 
that this is about democracy or something like that. Come on. It's time for us to wake up. It's time for us to wake up and we will, we will welcome you with open arms. All right. Now I've got an amazing conversation for you. A quick conversation um, with our friend Jennifer Law. You know Jennifer because she's been on twice and you love every time I interview her. Founder and president of the Center for Bioethics and Culture Network. She is a former pediatric critical care nurse and hospital administrator. We have talked to her in the past about the ethics of things uh, like IVF and like surrogacy. She has done a lot of work in this area. Go back, listen to those previous Uh, interviews if you haven't already and she has just produced an amazing documentary called the detransition diaries saving our sisters it's so compelling and i just want to hear you or uh, i just want you to hear her talk about it and then i want you to go immediately and download it and watch it with all of your friends and family before we get into that uh, conversation let me tell you about our next sponsor for the day that is carly jean los angeles Carly Jean Los Angeles is a family business that was created for women to help simplify their lives through easy, beautiful, and comfortable clothes. As a mom of four, Carly realized that there weren't, uh, there just weren't the kind of clothes that she was looking for. Like she wanted something versatile. She wanted something that worked in every season of the year, also every season of motherhood. So pregnancy, postpartum, nursing, all that. So she just decided to create her own capsule clothing company. And I'm so glad that she did because I can say that she accomplished her goal. She filled that void. I love Carly Jean Los Angeles, both the people that own it, what it stands for, and then also their clothes. I'm wearing it right now. I'm wearing this tank top and I'm wearing my Carly Jean jeans as I am almost on a daily basis. Love this company so much. Go to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Use promo code AllieB for 20% off, excluding final sale items. Um, uh, Go to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Promo code AllieB for 20% off. Okay, before we start talking to Jennifer, let me play you a short trailer of her documentary. From when I was very young, around five years old, I felt like I was limited in what I could do in life as a girl or as a woman. By the time I was about 13, I was starting to feel really depressed. I started self-harming. I started developing an eating disorder. I was introduced to a belief system. If you don't fit in, that's a sign that you're trans. If you don't like your body, then that's a sign that you're trans. And if you transition, all of these problems will be fixed. When I was 22, I started injecting testosterone into my body so that I could medically transition from female to male. Pretty much as soon as I turned 18, I made an appointment. I went to Planned Parenthood. One appointment took about an hour. I called Planned Parenthood. We had about a 30 minute phone conversation and then I was prescribed testosterone over the phone. I was saying stuff like, oh, I think that I'm gonna be so much happier after I transition. Like, I'm really depressed now and, I, and I'm suicidal, but everything's gonna be so much better after I transition. I wanted people to know that there is life after detransition, even if you've made serious physical changes. Woman, women, mother, mum, girls, girls, daughter. To those people, the peddlers of transgender ideology, these are not your words to give away. Jennifer, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us this time. Yeah, this time we're talking about the Detransition Diaries. You had your big launch last night. Tell us about it. What is this documentary about? Yeah, well, we did. We went live yesterday. So we actually rented a a movie theater, which is great because the theaters were closed for so long with uh, COVID. So it was nice to see a film on the big screen and a big live audience. And we didn't have any protesters, which was Gosh, surely an answer to prayer because we were expecting to have all kinds of people screaming on the street. Yes. But it was a good energy, um, a a well-engaged audience. I was surprised by how many people said they actually teared up and how emotional the film was, which I agree it is. But um, the Detransition Diaries is uh, a look at three women who thought that they were born in the wrong body and thought 
told were told that and felt that if they changed their sex and became men that that would solve all their problems and make all their gender dysphoria and their depression and their body image problems go away mm -hmm. of course they only found out that it didn't help um, and in fact it actually made things quite worse in some of their cases so it's a beautiful story of you know three first-hand account um, you know women telling their story and I I all through the whole um editing and scripting process, people kept asking me, do you have a favorite in the film? And I actually just fell in love with all three of these women. They're, they're dynamic, they're, they're bold and courageous, they're sweet and kind, they're articulate. They don't come across as mean or angry or bitter, they come across as very trustworthy. And I just felt honored to be able to hold their stories and let the world sort of hear their stories. And then the film also was released yesterday on demand on our Vimeo channel. So people who missed the live theater audience um, can go to our Vimeo channel and watch the film. Good. And we'll definitely link that in the description, both on YouTube and on the listening side of things so people can easily click it. And obviously, we want people to go watch this uh, for themselves. So I don't want to give too much away. But when you were talking to these women, what was one common thread that you saw maybe early on in their lives that seemed to be um, an indication that things weren't going the way that they should, at least as far as their mental health goes? Was it their upbringing? Was it a traumatic event? Was it involvement in social media forums? What did you find there? Yeah, I mean, I, again, just to remind your audience who don't know me, I did work in, in clinical nursing for many, many years. So what was um, sort of scandalous and appalling to me was the fact that these women did all have various trouble, troubling backgrounds that should have been red flags before doctors and therapists started putting them on what I call the super highway to transgender medicine or affirmation care. Um, so yeah, one woman experienced a significant loss as a young girl, a, a death of somebody close to her. And the family that she grew up in was kind of a family that didn't talk about things that sort of swept things under the rug. Um, you know, they all had those awkward moments as young girls where they felt uncomfortable in their body. They didn't like their body. They thought they were fat and they were ugly. They didn't fit in. Um, they wished that they could be boys because boys seem to have such an easier uh, road, <laughs> if you will. Mm -hmm. So, so many, you know, eating disorders was a common uh, theme with a couple of the girls. Um, and, you know, they weren't, um, but 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 I want to put that in the sense of this. These are oftentimes very normal things that right. young right. young people go through. So it wasn't like they needed to be institutionalized. Yeah, they needed counseling. They need therapy. Um, but they didn't need hormones and surgeries. Right. And that's that's the thing is that and you know you've talked about this a lot. Abigail Schreier has talked about this a lot. That. Young girls, I mean, adolescents in general, but especially young girls, you do go through a period when you are going through puberty or just during those teenage years where it's really hard sometimes to be in your own body. It's really hard to be a girl. I talked to a detransitioner a few weeks ago. Her name was uh, her name is Sophie, and she was talking about. We talked about how one aspect of her wanting to quote unquote become a boy or a man was to try to get rid of the vulnerability that she saw as inherent in womanhood that she just was very uncomfortable with as her body changed and as she grew up with being sexualized, with being objectified, with being looked at or gawked at or. Um, or whistled at or whatever it is. And she felt that, well, if I become more masculine first, you know, just dressing in a masculine way, but then actually trying to identify as a man, getting top surgery, going on hormones, then I won't be prey anymore. Then I won't be vulnerable. And while I have never struggled with any kind of gender confusion, I understand that mentality. I understand that fear. I understand the vulnerable that is in the vulnerability that is innate in femininity and that is innate yeah. in womanhood um, that yeah. really, you know, men can't fully comprehend. But instead of showing compassion to these young women and saying, hey, this is normal and here's how we kind of deal with these feelings, 
they're being pushed. And as you have mentioned before, into being slaves to the medical industrial complex that's just pushing them on this, as you said, this highway to transition. Yeah. And one of the young women in the film actually did have that kind of experience as a little girl. She had a little neighborhood boy playmate um, who was way too wise or (laughs) unwise for his young years and, you know, would actually say, you know, we should kiss and we should take our clothes off and do things like that, which made her feel very uncomfortable as a you know, a younger than 10 year old little girl, as you can imagine. And and children don't really know how to handle those kind of things other than they feel um, at risk. They feel, they feel afraid. So I remember as a young nurse, you know, it was back in the day before we had all this um, sexual harassment stuff in the workplace. And, you know, I, I had doctors that would be very inappropriate with, with me. I oftentimes when I would get off work at the hospital at midnight at night, I had to walk out to a dark parking lot to get to my car would feel like, you know, really afraid. I don't think men sort of have that kind of, you know, category that they don't walk out at night to their car in the dark and feel like, oh my gosh, am I going to get attacked? Yeah, right. And so I think that we're just kind of categorizing all of these very normal feelings, or maybe sometimes they're abnormal, Some because some of these girls, they don't just have the normal discomfort that comes with adolescence and growing up, but they also have serious trauma in their past, or they have serious depression, serious anxiety. Sometimes they're on the autism spectrum. And even that, all of that is kind of being, in some cases, shoved to the side and just kind of placed under this umbrella while you're probably just transgender. And then what's being found is that transitioning is not actually helping the mental health of these young girls. Is that what the women that you interviewed found as well? Yeah, they they kept thinking that, you know, there, there was flags along the way in their steps in their transition, you know, when they went on to testosterone and this, all the negative effects of testosterone. When one of the women in the film actually moved forward with the double mastectomy and had her breasts removed, but they, they tell themselves that because they have this dysphoria, this is part of what I need to do to get rid of this dysphoria. So when they have negative symptoms of testosterone, they go, but but that bright future is just around the corner if mm-hmm. I just stay on this path. And maybe I feel regret right now, but you know, tomorrow will be better. You know, we've all been in situations in our life where things are really going bad and we just kind of go, tomorrow will be better, tomorrow will be better. Right. Um, and it was only until, uh, you know, in in Cats, Cat is one of the women in the film who's a beautiful singer. She actually produced and performs an original song in the film, you know, when the testosterone just totally destroyed her singing voice mm. that that jarred her enough to take you know to take the steps back and stop taking the testosterone and she canceled her double mastectomy surgery it was when grace went on a, a website and heard of another transition person who kept talking about no matter what they did with their body in in surgeries and corrections and therapies and drugs they they found something else to be unhappy with. And she realized at that point, there will be no bottom to this. I will, even if I have now the phalloplasty surgery, then I will have something else. She saw, talks about how I still have wide hips like a woman and I can't get rid of my hips. Yes. So she realized then that there was really no bottom to this, pursuing this path and just stopped you know, immediately. Right. Um, she's not sure whether she's going to have reconstructive surgery at this point. She's not sure if she's damaged her fertility. She talks about on the film about how when she transitioned, she wasn't thinking she even wanted children. But now that she's happily married to a man, she's really wants children. And she doesn't know if she'll be able to have uh, children now that she's taken so much testosterone in her body. Okay, quick pause from that conversation to tell you guys about GenuCell. If you are looking for good skincare that can help you reduce the appearance of fine lines in aging, then you should check out GenuCell. They are completely confident that you are going to love their stuff. They have a money back guarantee. You can try it for several days. If you don't like it, they will send your money 
back, you are guaranteed to see results in less than 12 hours or yeah, as little as 12 hours or your money back. They use plant stem cell technology to get rid of fine lines, forehead wrinkles, dark spots, even those bags and puffiness under your eyes. So check them out. Go to genucell.com slash Allie. That's G-E-N-U-C-E-L.com slash Allie. Genucell.com slash Allie. And that's one aspect of this that just breaks my heart is that, of course, when you're 16, 17, even 20 years old, you just don't really have the capacity to understand what you will want on the other side of this, what you will want one day. Of course, you don't want children right now. You're young. You're living your life. You're doing what you want to do. So it's hard for you to imagine the desires that come with growing up. And one of those desires is motherhood. And you have completely, um, these doctors have completely ruined their chances, these girls' chances of becoming moms biologically very often. And even if they don't, even if they gain their fertility, these women, these young women, young girls who are having double mastectomies, they'll never be able to breastfeed. They'll never even have that option. That's something that has been taken away from them forever. And it just seems like so much of the compassion in the mainstream, even part of like what I would consider the quote unquote, I don't know, social justice church, the compassion and empathy we're told only has to be directed towards those who say that they're the opposite gender from what they are. But I really don't see those people very often highlighting these detransition stories and looking look like we're causing irreversible damage and very few people are willing to stand up and say stop. Yeah, and we had a discussion last night after the showing of the film, and Kat in the film was on hand, so she was live in the audience. And we also had a a mother um, who's very involved in the state of California opposing our our gender affirmation laws that are on Governor Newsom's desk right now for him to sign. And, you know, it was very clear that, um, you know, these, these kids are also spending so much time on social media. And when this one mom was talking about her own daughter who became what is called a de-sister, meaning her daughter lived, dressed, acted like a man, but never took any drugs or any surgery, Mm -hmm. but she desisted in that she became comfortable being a girl in her girl body. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that mother said she took her, her daughter's phone away. She she went to every school board meeting. She read every single book that her child was going to be asked to read before her child even started school that year. She looked at the curriculum. Um, she talked about being the only parent at a school board meeting this last year where this, you know, they were going to be teaching gender. This is curriculum. after her child desisted or before? Before, during, and after. She is she's now happily living with her desisted daughter, but still very active. Um, in fighting the good fight in the state. And she runs the, um, she's the local woman that runs the ourduty.group, which is an international um, project. But she gave some real practical things because that's what people need, especially parents. You know, when you all of a sudden have a child that you've known and loved their whole life and all of a sudden they come home and say they're born in the wrong body and they want you to call them this, you know, parents need the tools because right now they're not going to be able to be getting trustworthy tools from their physician necessarily, from their child's teacher necessarily, from therapists, um, the internet. But but when you look at the growing number of detransitioners in the Reddit community, yes. uh, it's exploding. And I think, you know, the, the trans activists like to say that these detransitioners are a mi- minority, a minor voice in this debate, which they are not. And I think we are going to see way more people becoming more emboldened to tell their story once movies like The Detransition Diaries and others come out and and people start hearing, whoa, what are we doing? What have we done? Yeah. So this is a good movie, obviously, to watch if you're on our side of things and you already know how dangerous and and deadly this whole industry and movement is is just to hear from people's personal stories, just to be equipped uh, with those stories and with those testimonies. But it would also be great for you to watch, for people to watch with those who are on the fence. Or maybe they're not even on the fence, but they just kind of deny that this is something that exists. Or who think, as I kind of described a second ago, who think all the empathy should just be in the direction of affirming someone's stated identity 
identity rather than seeing the physical damage that is being done on these young people's bodies. So this is going to convince and persuade, but it's also going to embolden those of us and empower those of us who already are in this fight, just remind us uh, to yeah. double down on our efforts. And so I'm just so thankful for you for giving a platform to these Thank women. You. I hope that you make many more detransition diaries. <laughs> Fortunately and unfortunately, there will be many yeah. more of these stories and someone's got to give them a pedestal. And so I'm thankful that you're doing that. So people Thank can you. go to the Vimeo link, correct? Is there anywhere else you'd like them to go? Well, I think the Vimeo channel first, because I really want people to see the movie. If you just go to Vimeo and you just search for the Detransition Diaries, the film will pop up. Um, but we do have a, a YouTube channel that's full of all kinds of other free content. And uh, all of our other movies are there. The Vimeo is a pay-per-view, so we're asking people to be willing to chip in. I'm telling people it's basically about the cost of a Starbucks pumpkin latte <laughs> to watch it. Okay. Um, just because we have some some budget bills to pay, but yeah. one, once we've covered our budget, we'll we'll move it onto YouTube for free viewing too. And we've yeah. already had people in Italy that have asked to translate the film into Italian, so that and that's in 20, awesome. 24 hours. <laughs> that is awesome. Well, I just pray that this continues to take off. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for taking the time to come on and for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Okay, guys, hope you enjoyed that full episode. Remember to check out our stickers. We got lots of stickers on our merch site. We've got lots of new stuff coming. I know I said I talk about Chrissy Teigen today, and I, again, didn't have time. If I have time, I will talk about that tomorrow. Okay, thanks so much for listening. We will see you guys back here tomorrow.